Now, you probably noticed that the ruling class are in an absolute flap over the question of empire, and um, particularly so in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. They can't decide, really, whether they should apologise for the worst excesses of colonialism and try and move on, or whether they should tough it out instead and instead be proud of uh, what the empire achieved. And some of them are trying to mix the two. Uh, last month, Prince Charles was at the Commonwealth Conference in Rwanda, and he say, talked of his personal sorrow at the suffering caused by slavery. And a speech he made on the same subject two years ago in Ghana, he added this. He said, Britain can be proud that it later led the way in the abolition of this shameful trade. We have a shared responsibility to ensure that the abject horror of slavery is never forgotten. Now, for those of you who don't speak ruling class, I'm going to do a translation for you. <laughs> what that means is, Britain has made up for the crime of slavery by abolishing it. Can we move on now, please? So, and Charles isn't the first European monarch to tour the world issuing vague apologies. Uh, Belgium's Killing Philippe was, uh, earlier last month, expressing similar regrets over Belgium's, uh, quotes, violent acts and humiliations, quotes, that his ancestors inflicted on the Congolese. And let's be clear about those violent acts. That's the deaths of 10 million people. And it's not 250 years ago, at the height of the slave trade, many of those 10 million people were killed in the 20th century, so within you know, within a few generations of, 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 of himself. During their time in Ethiopia and the DRC respectively, uh, sorry, in, R in Rwanda and, and the DRC respectively, neither monarch did anything substantive or suggested any substantive change, reparations, anything of the kind. Um, but the fact that they felt they had to start by making an apology speaks volumes, I think. It tells us about how the political terrain uh, has shifted. And that pressure that they're under is expressing itself in, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, think about all the kind of demands that fall under the banner of decolonization, from the demand to remove the statues of slavers and the direct action people have taken to remove them themselves, uh, to the demands for the proper teaching of empire in schools uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on, to the demands that our universities come to reflect the societies that they're supposed to serve, both in terms of their student intake and in terms of their, their teaching staff. And, you know, we can think about also like the museums, the battle to return the artifacts that were stolen from Africa, from Asia, from Australasia, from America, and held in, it held in the West uh, 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 unduly. But above all else, there is a demand for public recognition of the terrible damage that slavery and colonialism did and continues to do. And that's what really groups the whole question of decolonization together. It's that, it's that demand. Now, all of these and, and, and many more have a connection to decolonization. But what the movement actually stands for and what, uh, is quite disparate and what its politics are are quite disparate. And so what I'm not going to try and do is give you a list of all the different political philosophies that are engaging with de uh, decolonization and have something to say. I think that's not, not that useful. But I think what we can say is that decolonization is an attempt at the moment primarily to link the racism that exists in society now to what happened in the past. To say not only that there is a link, but to try and precisely locate how that link functions. Now, the right wing have focused on decolonization's apparent threat to uh, monuments slavers of slavers and colonial races. And their argument really is that what the decolonization movement wants to do is to wipe out the past, to whitewash Britain's history is the, the phrase that, uh, that, 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 that the Tories use. And it's an absolute nonsense, because if the movement wants to do anything, it wants to expose the past. It wants people to question the past, to know about the past, 
to argue and discuss the past. That's its primary, really, uniting, uniting force. And in particular, people want to understand the way colonial era racism has been updated and indeed reinvented for different stages of, of, of capitalist development. Now, for, I think most of us, for example, and most people who would describe themselves as, as part of this movement, instead of merely getting rid of all the artifacts of, of uh, the, uh, the slavers and colonists, we want a museum. We want a place where we can have a proper discussion of colonialism and anti-colonialism that would feature the objects that, s that best describe what, what the, 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 the bloodthirsty trade of slavery and the indignities uh, 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 and barbarism of colonialism. And we want in there the figures of resistance. We want people to know about Toussaint L'Ouverture. We want people to know about, uh, uh, about Samuel Sharp. We want to know people to know about the, the slave rebellions. We want to know people to know about the colonial uprising. So we're not the people who are trying to brush this under the carpet. And we're not the people who don't want people to discuss Britain's, Britain's history. Now, what, how empire is understood is absolutely vital to the ruling class. And it's, it's vital because it's central to the carefully cultivated myth of Britishness. Now, Michael Gove was the uh, education secretary some years ago, and he instructed that British values had to be taught in schools. And the British values he was talking about are, quote, democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance for those of different faiths and beliefs. So what's happening here is that we're creating a self-image of Britain as this important nation that pioneers these values upon which we can agree are the most enlightened values. And along with that goes the way we pioneered the Enlightenment. We pioneered industrial capitalism. And so we pioneered the modern world. In other words, there was this, these parts of our history that we are supposed to be proud of. And our superiority, the superiority of our ideas, is best shown about the, in the way the British Empire domi dominated the world. And there are whole uh, schools of people who are paid handsomely to churn out these ignorant defences of empire. Think of Niall Ferguson. Uh, he's on to series six now on the BBC. Very well, well paid, the uh, academic is. And he churns out these ignorant defences of British rule in India and Africa where the tales of industrial revolutions in Britain are separated from the colonial trade routes and separated from colonial labour uh, that, uh, that made the rapid development of Britain possible. And the Enlightenment is mapped exclusively as a European project. And, uh, and it's removed from its context of imperialism and slavery. And in this kind of worldview, Islamic scholarship from the Middle East and Africa and the birth of recorded knowledge is written out of history, uh, as, as is the uh, numerical systems that emerged in Persia and, uh, and Asia. They have no place in this kind of schema, do they? And they, they, want to, they don't want to acknowledge the more radical thinkers of the Enlightenment, including those who thought that China was uh, uh, an exemplary society in many ways more advanced than uh, more advanced than Britain. So the creation of this national self-identity can seem as though it's obsessed with the past. It can seem as though it is just about an interpretation of the past. But actually what's happening here is this. The more that they can tell us that Britain's role in empire was a civilizing mission to raise up the rest of the world to our standards, the more they get away with imperialist adventures today. Because then you can say, what we're doing in Africa today, what we're doing in the Middle East today, is attempt to, to raise up the people, to defend the people, to act in humanitarian ways. Now, I think just as the ruling class has its own understanding of empire, we have to have an understanding. And there are big debates about this. So I'm going to spe spend a bit of time talking about the development of the British Empire, and I'm going to concentrate on India. Um, I'm going to concentrate on it for two reasons. One is that India was the cornerstone of the British Empire, and the other reason is that Brian Richardson over here was uh, 
it is talking specifically on the question of uh, uh, on the on the question of slavery and reparations to tomorrow afternoon. So here we go. India was one of Britain's earliest uh, colonial acquisitions, and it became a template really for what was then to happen in 19th century, late 19th century Africa. The colonial mindset um, is that Britain came to dominate the world because of its genius. But those who think that empire came about as an expression of white supremacy are quite wrong. And the reason we can say that is that when the first ships uh, from the British East India Company arrived off the, coast, the west coast of India in 1601, they um, encountered a society that in many ways was more advanced than the one that they'd come from. Uh, if you think about what they were coming for, they wanted Indian textiles, they wanted the embroidery, they wanted the spices, they wanted the crafts, and they wanted them because you could sell them for big money back in England and across Europe. In other words, India was producing stuff that just could not be produced to the same standard in Britain. And that's why, if you look at the uh, Empire uh, Aurangzeb, who was the head of the Mughal Empire in 17, 1700, his share of the world economy was around 27%, which was larger than the combined share of the entirety of Europe at that time. And it gives you a sense of how important India was and how, how advanced it was. The idea of the innate superiority of the pale-skinned man in such a circumstance would have seen, seemed absurd. It, it would have been a stupid suggestion. And across the world, from China to India to North Africa, there were huge and prosperous countries that were populated by non-white peoples. So it proves exactly the opposite. And it's really interesting. If you read the book by um, uh, Leela Abdu, uh, Abdu uh, Lukod, which is a book called um, Be uh, Before European Hegemony, she argues that in 1750, Britain only had a small lead in manufacturing output over its rivals. Who were its closest rivals? Not France, not Belgium, not Germany, no. China, India, Brazil were its close, closest rivals in, seven, in 1750. So you, that gives you a sense that in the world that Britain didn't come into empire as a dominant, a dominant force in the world. So when and where did the racism that we come to associate with empire come about? And here we have to understand a little bit of the process of history. Under pressure from the European forces, the Mughal Empire, which had run India since the 16th century, begins to crumble by the mid-18th century. That's partly under the weight of the own, its own contradictions as an empire, most empires had them, um, but also it's partly to do with the growing pressure from outside. This was a period when the enormous wealth of slavery was funding the industrialization of Britain, and that power enabled the one-time, small-time traders in India to move from being outsiders on, in the ports and a few ports to developing the first stages of colonialization. <coughs> they started to replace local princes and collected taxes for themselves. Likewise, the old landlords either agreed to British domination or were replaced with new zamindaris and the wealth of the fields was now carted off to ports to be exported. So India's poor start to produce profits for England. And that process uh, results in the end with industrial goods from England flooding the Indian market and destroying what native infra uh, industry there, 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 there was. And it, in the process, it throws India backwards, both economically and socially. You have this very advanced society which is thrown backwards by its interaction, in, by its interaction with, with the European powers and Britain in particular. Now, the way the East India Company comes to dominate India, both physically and economically, requires explanation. You know, there, there requires uh, a, an understanding. And it comes by modifying the racist explanations that had been developed to justify slavery. But whereas once, they had to develop a set of ideas that explained how their profits were being made out of the blood of slaves. They explained it quite simply. Yes, we believe in the rights of man. Yes, we believe in life and liberty. But I tell you what, 
That accounts for human beings. Black people are not human beings. That's the way they squared the circle. When it came to India, they were no longer relying on unfree labour to the extent that they had been in the plantations, and they could modify racism. So now they said, what we are doing is we are relating to a society as if they are children. These people are infants. We are to raise them up to be adults. They will learn from us. And that's the way racism came to, uh, to, to British racism came to describe India as though it was an infant society that had to be nurtured by the British. And that's why you get Rudyard Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden. It, you know, to, to, it's our burden that we have to lift up these people from their lowly position and drag them into civilization. So there you start to see the emergence of racism. And that's where, the, where, where British racism in empire really, really starts. And not only did these uh, theories of race explain the difference between the, the standing of the Indian compared to the standing of, uh, of the British, but it starts to create a pecking order within the colonised themselves. So you start to, from and, the, and it's, this is best seen from the vantage point of 1857, the great uh, Indian uprising against British rule, in which hundreds of thousands of troops, Indian troops in the British, in British company army, rose up and killed their officers and, and rampaged to try and take India back for uh, from, 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 from the British. The response of the British to that was to try and create separate regiments in the future, uh, not based on geography, but on religious lines and ethnic lines. And here's what one officer said they were attempting to do. He said, I wish to have different and rival spirits in different regiments so that a Sikh might fire into a Hindu, a Gorkha into either, without any need for scruple in, a, 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 in any case. So th the idea was that you would create this rivalry inside the country you were colonising in order that they saw each other as enemies rather than you as the enemy. Divide and rule, the tactic uh, w w was known, and it served the British well in India. And, you know, you cannot understand the tragedy of partition in 1947 and the slaughter that happens without understanding that the original sin is the way the British played these ethnicities, divide and rule cards in order to, to maintain their rule. Now, in the 19th and 20th century, this kind of crude racism of the colonial oppressor is supplemented by the development of science. Now, we are told science is neutral, science is unquestionable, but here, science comes ways in absolutely to shore up racism and to give it new credibility. And its chief reasoning was that it could explain how the world was divided into races as part of a, a wider series of hierarchies. It explains how the world was divided into classes, that classes were a natural reflection of our intelligence, and so was race. race races corresponded directly to, uh, uh, to ideas of, uh, of intelligence. And so we had universities, including UCL, what, three miles down the road from here, which were developing kits to develop, to measure people's exact skin pigmentations, the shape of their eyes, the color of their hair, the texture of their hair, and so on, so that we could be put in hierarchy and be placed there and know that our place in the world was determined by how we passed those tests, where we stood in relation to, the, to, the, to those, to those tests. And so from, <laughs> I do apologize. Uh, so from the 18th century onwards, the British colonial masters developed a set of racist ideas that both justified their rule, gave them a civilizing mission, and they would repeat this pattern again and again. I want to move to racism in the post-empire world. Now, the period after the Second World War is a deeply traumatic one for empire. Now, you imagine, you spent all these years explaining to people about how if you are from a certain race, you can only reach this station in life. It's impossible for you to go any further. It's the white man's job to raise up all of these, these nations. You've been doing that for, for 200 years. And then in the space of 20 years, there is uprising after uprising after uprising, 
and country after country liberates themselves from colonialism. And now the people you said could do no more than a minor clerical job are running the bloody country. Now, that for racists was an incredible shock to the system all over the world, but particularly here in Britain at the, ho at the centre of empire. The, if you think about what that period would have been like, I mean, 1960 alone, 17 African countries liberated themselves from, from colonialism. You can imagine what a terrible shock to empire that would have been and what a shock to racism. Now, this would have been a crisis in its own terms, but the fact that there were now thousands of colonial, formerly colonial subjects now in Britain, rebuilding Britain after the Second World War, running the health service, running transport, building houses, all that sort of thing, the fact they were now in your country, in your workplace, was, you know, a cause for a massive distress amongst the, uh, the ra racists in Britain. And the proximity of their problem causes another change in racist thinking. It necessitates another, uh, uh, an another way of understanding the difference between people. Now, the horrors of the Second World War meant that it was no longer really acceptable to talk in terms of genetics, to start measuring people's skulls and any of that stuff. That's, you can't do that anymore after Auschwitz. It's, it's not possible. And instead, what we find is there's a development of the idea that races are separated, not by biology as such, but by culture. That we're separated because there are cultures that are more or less compatible with white society, with European values. So you have cultures which easily fit in. Uh, you know, the cultures of people who are essentially white-skinned, maybe from the other part of Europe, they, 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 they can fit. But people with brown skins, people with black skin, well, they're, they're a long way from us. And a lot of, you think about a lot of the, lot of the discussion at that time starts with these kind of, I'm quite sorry, I'm talking to my dad about this. He came here in 1962, and he'd say, people would say, oh, we can't take any more, there's not enough room, you know, there's, there's not enough houses. Um, they tr and it quickly moves on to, yeah, I don't like the smell of their cooking. And, uh, you know, they, they, you know they, they, they have some strange practices. And uh, look at what's happened to the church down the road. Now it's a temple, or now it's a mosque. And, you know, there's this climate of racism develops, which is very much uh, fed by, by, the, by the ruling class. Now, it's very tempting to try and suggest that really this racism is simply about lack of resources, that uh, there's not enough jobs, there's not enough houses, and if there was, then people wouldn't be racist. But there's something more fundamental at work here, and we have to try and name it. See, it's, I think it's really interesting that uh, the chauvinist ideas that many English workers had towards Irish workers in, th in the previous century give us some examples about, um, about what the mindset of this, of, of this racism, racism is. And um, here I think there's a really interesting book by a guy called Satnam Verdi. And he, he says this, he says, being able to lay claim to membership of the ruling, ra uh, ruling race of a nation proved a powerful means by which to justify the exclusion of Irish people from good jobs as well as others who could not be imagined as an organic element of this island race. It gave the English working class, and this is the important bit, it gave the English working class another strategy for imp improving its economic and political standing, one no longer dependent on the manufacture of broad-based class solidarity, nor a full frontal conf confrontation with the state, simply by asserting their legitimate rights as members of the British nation. And what he's saying there is that if you think you are in a club with the ruling class because you have white skin, you think that that should earn you certain advantages. It should earn you the right to a house, to a decent job, to, to a decent wage, uh, 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 and, uh, and so on. And so there's a deliberate attempt by the ruling class in this country to cultivate exactly that feeling. And its main purpose is to blunt any class opposition, a, a multiracial class opposition to them. The more people can be encouraged to think themselves part of an elite, 
part of a privileged layer. The more they believe that, the less they are inclined, inclined, towards, inclined towards, towards struggle. Now, there's some conclusions we can draw from this. Um, the first conclusion I think we can draw is that racism is not unchanging. And if it, if it means it's not unchanging, then it's not innate. What we're dealing with here is not a set of values that are bor people are born with, hardwired into their psychology, and that really are inevitable, the not results of which are inevitable. Because if that was the case, racism wouldn't have to change over time. It wouldn't have to, re to respond to different circumstances and adapt. It would mean a static set of ideas. Instead, what we have is a movable set of ideas that reflects this, the situation. But it also then raises another question. So one of the dangers of some of the language associated with decolonization is that it can suggest that there's, this is really a binary divide. And the binary divide is between those who are colonized and those who are colonizers. And that means if you live in the empire, in the heart of empire, like you live in Britain, then you are part of the colonizers. And if you live in the world that was colonized, then you are, you are the colonized. Now, the obvious problems with this. Now, think about, um, two, there's two points I would make about this. Look, not everyone who suffered the indignities of colonialism later became a friend of anti-colonialism and anti-racism. And that's evident still today. You think that Rwanda was a German colony, was a Belgian colony uh, until independence, and today it's part of the British Commonwealth, and its neoliberal uh, president, Paul Kagamwe, recently signed the deal with the British government that allows the offshoring of our asylum seekers uh, in, 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 in in Rwandan, uh, in Rwandan uh, 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 camps. Now, Kagame is, uh, is an enemy of anti-racist, and he and all the other capitalist uh, African and Asian leaders, he's not simply a puppet of colonialism. We can't simply say all he's doing is doing colonialism's business. And the reason we can say that is that we can understand him better as a junior imperialist power. The Rwandan ruling class have their own class interests that they want to pursue. Look at the role, and if you want to understand this, look at the role of Rwanda the, that it's playing in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where they are backing the rebels who are attacking that government. Now, it's the West says that it's appalled by this. The US and the EU have both at different times leveled sanctions against the Rwandan regime for doing this, and yet the Rwandan regime does it anyway. Why? because it's in the interests of the Rwandan ruling class to pursue its own agenda. So simply to say that these African and Asian leaders are puppets of US imperialism or puppets of colonialism, that isn't a good enough explanation for me because it doesn't explain how they act sometimes in opposition and sometimes against the wishes of the main imperial, um, imperial powers. And secondly, the, there's a big problem, I think, with saying that everyone who lives in empire who lives in countries that were the centers of empire is, in, is complicit in the strategy of empire itself. I think there has been a strategy of anti, uh, a, st a thread of anti-racism in the British working class that can be traced all the way back to slavery. In this area, like literally here where we're sat, it was known in the 18th century that if you were a runaway slave, a black slave with a white master, in the centre of town, if you could make it here to the east end of London, there was no way your master would come to the east end to try and uh, try and have you arrested and taken back. Why? Because the mob would protect you. And what they meant by the mob was that the disparate poor who lived here by primarily here would not allow masters to reclaim slaves from 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 this area. And they, you can carry on tracing this to. Think about the, think about Sheffield, 1794, a huge rally against slavery, where they pass a resolution. This is mostly artisans, or right, people before the working class, who said, wishing to be rid of the weight of oppression under which we groan, we are induced to compassionate those who groan also. We have pledged ourselves to avenge peaceably the ages of wrongs done to our Negro brethren. 
The meeting is so large that the city of Sheffield bans public meetings for several years uh, 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 afterwards. Or think about the American Civil War, 1860s, where the Lancashire cotton workers supported the North in the Civil War, despite the fact that the North was blockading the cotton, the ports in the South that sent cotton to the Lancashire mills. And they, they stood for years on the side of the North. Why? Because of their opposition to slavery. Now, Lincoln, who goes on to become the first president, uh, one of the first presidents of the United States, he says, the Lancashire cotton workers were an instance of sublime Christian heroism which has not been surpassed in any age or any country. Now, that's a nice sentiment. Uh, I'm sure I agree with it. But there's more to it than that, isn't there? It's not just that the people... Uh, in, in Lancashire had good morals. What they understood was that the same boss that was sweating them that allowed children to work in the factories for 18 hours a day, six and a half days a week, and allowed them to work in the mines, is the same boss that owns the plantation. It's the same boss that is shipping the slaves. In other words, the same class enemy that you faced is the one that we are facing on the other side, on the other side, uh, the other side of the world, and what that says to me is that what we learn from this trajectory is that we are not just fighting relics of empire. We are not fighting the old symbols of the old regime. We are fighting contemporary racism, not just because it exists as a set of ideas, but because racism is central to capitalism. It was central back at the time of slavery. It was central at the time of colonialism. It remains central today to the ruling class. The necessity to divide all of us between black and white and brown, to pitch each other as enemies in order for that minority to carry on, to carry on ruling. And so for, the, for that struggle to win, decolonization has to be an opposition to capitalism. That's it. Yes, thanks, Yuri. That was a brilliant introduction. Um, so we have plenty of time for discussion. But yes. <coughs> Hello. Um, I have a few disagreements with what was said by the, you know, the, the panel. First of all, I don't know if it's deliberate, but you kind of left out the fact that racism. Well, when you're talking about the scientific, you know, aspect of racism you brushed over it, you kind of just made a general statement. Um, you didn't mention people like Darwin, Francis Galton, how these people actually established you know, racism from the scientific point of view before they sent them over to Africa and you know, India. You didn't, I don't know if it's deliberate or you just missed it in that point. That's the first one. The second one is um, about Africa. The leaders are not just there or carrying out class war. They are carrying out, in some instances, even in Rwanda, they are doing what their masters taught, taught them to do, which is the West. They are, they are more or less the same thing as the people that, that kicked out. They're doing the same thing. The West, even worse. So those are the two points. I think you, you, you know, so I, I just thought I'd mention those. You want to go over them again or something? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, next is just the guy here with the red star on his shirt. And then um, I might go to the lady here with the berry. Okay, my name's uh, Sasha. Um, I'm, I live in Hackney. And for the last two and a bit years, we've been fighting um, over a statue of a 17th century slaver called... Uh, um, Jeffrey, Robert Jeffrey, that stands over the Museum of the Home. Now, two years ago, after Colston fell, and all credit to Colston, it's disgusting that the government are trying to get the Colston fall back into court. When that fell, um, the, the trustees of the museum themselves carried out uh, a, uh, a consultation with the people of Hackney about what they wanted to do with the statue, and over 70% of us said take it down. Only 8% of the people who responded had a positive view of it, and they were going to start to, t to, to bring it down when um, the government, in the, 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 the form of Oliver Dowden, who was then culture secretary, stepped in and said, look, 
you're not bringing it down. Um, you're a government-funded organisation. If you want that funding pulled, then um, you know, carry on doing what 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 you want to do. And we've been fighting ever since to, to bring that down. We've had some spectacular, some really good um, d demonstrations outside of it. But Dowden has gone on. I mean, he's no longer culture secretary. That that honour goes to N that mental giant Nadine Dorries. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, the, 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 that they have, they have taken that and widened it out to the whole museum sector. The government now tells the museums what they display and, uh, and what history they tell. Um, you know, and, and, and if anybody thinks that this is you know, just about the past and, uh, and whatever, just remember that Boris Johnson, in, uh, when he was editor of The Spectator, in February 2002, wrote an article saying the problem with Africa is not that we were once there, but that we are not there now. That's his, that's his attitude to, 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 to this thing. Now, when we've carried out our, our demonstrations at the, the Museum of the Home, the, the, the response from the people of Hackney is fantastic. Every bus goes past. It's, yeah, get the bastard down and, 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 and the rest of it. Very, uh, very, very good. What goes on in the, in the uh, museum is in instructive as well. They've had four, I think, four books on Geoffrey. None of them really mention One his minute. role in slavery. The fact that he had his own slave ship, the, mer the, the China Merchant, the fact that he had substantial shares as a well, director of the Africa, the Royal Africa um, uh, a, a Company. Um, so uh, the, the history is so awful, we've written our own history. Actually, we've got uh, Steve Cushions has put together a pamphlet. It's available in bookmarks. Please go and buy it. It's only four pounds. It's, uh, it's called Sir Robert Jeffrey and the Business of Slavery. And we're telling them to sell this in their bloody museum. One, we want that statue down. Two, we want proper history. And just to finish, um, you know, uh, one of the, 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 uh, Yuri's absolutely right about the anti-racist traditions in the in British working class or whatever. I think we've seen it recently in a, another form when the people of Peckham, when the people of Hackney, when the people of Edinburgh, when the people of Glasgow have come up to say you will not take our brothers and sisters uh, uh, in their immigration bans. Let's bring these, all the bloody slaver statues must fall. Uh, yeah, thank you for a great meeting, Yuri. I feel like you always talk the bits. Um, I, I wanted to say that I feel like, in terms of decolonization, I feel like we can, um, what was it, defeat the, um, the history of like uh, the empire. However, I do feel like within our own communities, um, specifically, I guess I'm gonna talk about like colorism in black communities and even like how different um, ethnic groups have like these divisions um, of um, or immigrants when <laughs> they come here and like you know having certain like <laughs> uh, so maybe the black community is against this community who's moved here and like all these sort of things that play into people's da daily lives. Um, I feel like that is something that we still need to work on. And personally, the fact that there are still issues such as colorism, people feeling the need to like bleach their skin and you know, even like caste, the caste systems that came from India, all these things, I think these are still very relevant topics where you can still see that the empire kind of has like left its legacy. Um, but, and, and as well, like, you know, some of this stuff takes a lot of internal work as well as, in, as individuals, but I think as a collective, as we can like learn together, um, the true histories of what happened. Um, I mean, I think obviously Black Lives Matters as well helped massively in like kind of stirring up conversations around the, the statues and, you know, um, teaching like black history in the schools, not just about slavery and all these things. So I think there is definitely a way out, but I just think it's going to keep, um, take people such as ourselves to be, continue being persistent and trying to like push forward change. That's it. Um, I think first thing is Sasha, Sasha referred to the immigration raid in Hackney and I think what was most significant about that was that the police arrived to harass a bunch of dispatch riders who've been protesting for months because they haven't got decent toilet facilities and they keep getting fined for parking their bikes while collecting for Deliveroo or whoever. And actually what happened on that, on that, on that protest was that the traders in um, Ridley Road Market, the people on the road and everybody else surrounded the police, surrounded the people they were trying to arrest and actually would not let them arrest them and take them away. And it was a straightforward racist immigration road. People just said absolutely no. And this was in Hackney where you know, we've got, there's a whole history going back years of Stoke Newton Police Station, but also the whole stuff that our young people in Hackney suffer through stop and search, through the sort of harassment of police, and obviously most recently, actually, the horrific experiences of Child Q um, at the hands of the police being strip searched. So I think there was huge amounts of anger about that, and it fed into that immigration raid. 
Um, so that's one thing. The other thing which kind of follows on is if you think about schools, you know, the education system for years was bedeviled by kind of pseudo-scientific nonsense about IQs and how you measure it and, you know, and you can just go through the arguments as to how utterly spurious most of it was as science and all the rest of it. But I think also you look at what's now happening to education and that idea of balance and, you know, the balance in the national curriculum, the, the idea that you're to kind of force balance onto universities. You know, what is the balance about the slave trade? It's just, you know, it's an absolute nonsense. But that is absolutely insistent what they're trying to do in terms of, you know, centralising the curriculum, centralising um, multi-academy trusts, kind of imposing a specific curriculum way of working. It also is a way of controlling what students get taught. So they do get this very sanitised version of history that I would guess a lot of us got at school. And then when I was at school, it was like, oh yeah, we were great because we abolished the slave trade in 1807 and then we, we abolished slavery in 1833 and never mind the 20 million we have spent the last 200 years paying off. So I think there was a huge fight around actually liberating the education system and making it anti-racist and not actually a repository of racist imperialist ideas which actually designed to put people down. Hello. Yeah, hi. So um, it's wonderful to hear about all these instances of working class uh, solidarity with uh, people of color, particularly black and Asian immigrants here. Uh, I was also wondering on uh, your take on white working class racism against the Bangladeshi community in East London. I'm talking about instances like Altabali. I'm talking about instances where uh, Bangladeshi workers were actually killed by uh, lumpen white uh, working class people, essentially. And how uh, to sort of contextualize that within Marxist discourse. And uh, my comment on, uh, on how colonialism worked in India uh, well, it worked through a number of ways, but uh, my particular comment would be about, uh, someone mentioned caste in India, and there were instances of Dalits, uh, there were instances of uh, quote-unquote lower caste communities siding with the British against the Brahmins who were immediately oppressing them. The Brahmins, the Peshwas, the upper castes, who were immediately uh, op oppressing them. Not to say that the British system was not oppressive, uh, there is a certain t uh, a certain line in anti-caste discourse in India that does uh, sort of express, uh, wouldn't say thanks, but acknowledge the uh, tradition of uh, liberal thinking as appropriated by Ambedkar and all these people later on uh, that promoted uh, the idea of the equality of all people. Obviously interpreted very differently as it was interpreted in Europe. So. How would you, I would, uh, I would actually be very cautious about making this whole uh, India against, uh, with or all natives, all colonial subjects against anti-colonial, uh, against colonial masters narrative because there were so many cross sections, especially in South Asia, and that is the one area that I do know. There were so many of these cross sections appearing. So that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Hi, um, I just wanted to share this quote from Lyndon B. Johnson, and it's, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best color person, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on, and he'll empty his pockets for you. And I think that just goes back to what you're saying about how racism is so integral with capitalism and how politicians use it as a way to push their platform and raise money and get time and resources from people who otherwise wouldn't think that. So, yeah, that's all I have. I, <coughs> just a question about the, um, the Mughal Empire, because, um, you know, as Yuri said, actually, um, when the East India Company uh, started operating in, in India in 1601, it was a very minor bit player. There were bigger players like the, the Portuguese and the Dutch. And at the time, everyone knew that the Mughal em Empire had the most powerful army probably in the world. They had better guns, they had better military tactics, they were superior military, military in every way. And there was an interesting book by William Dalrymple that documents just how military, the, the might of the, the Mughal Empire. What gets interesting is how this then uh, collapses uh, gradually from the mid-18th century, 
and it's to do with the developments of mil military technology in Europe. So, in the, you know, in the 18th century Europe, there were huge successions of wars, you know, European civil wars, wars of succession, which, which meant that the military technology in, in, in the Europe was developing much more quickly than in India because it was just, just one big empire. In Europe, you had competing empires, and so military warfare was more important. And it was actually by the mid-18th century that the Europeans, uh, uh, the French, realized that they had more uh, bet better uh, tactics uh, first. But the main point I want to say is the question about history and the role of Aurangzeb is, um, is quite relevant in, in India today because the, the BJP wants to uh, 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 obliterate the Mughal history of India. Aurangzeb is a go They literally want to wipe his name from the roads in India and they want to deny that whole Indo-Saracenic culture. So if you go to North India, you will see buildings which are called Indo-Saracenic which is a fusion of Islamic and Hindu culture. They hate that. They want to institute a pure Hindu culture. And I think it's a very reactionary step. And it shows you One how minute. politicized history is, not just in, in the UK, but in India as well. And India is now an imperial power with nuclear weapons. It's not the child of the West anymore. I'm going to hand back over to Yuri to come back on the discussion and to uh, close the meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for what was um, a really good discussion. Um, I don't want to add to what was said about Darwin because I agreed very much with it uh, on the question of scientific racism. But I will say this. I think it's very interesting that what the scientists in Britain determined to do was to try and explain why the world was the way it was as a natural phenomenon. They wanted to say the state of affairs that we have now is the inevitable outcome of our biology. And they set out to prove that case. In other words, rather than try and explain why the world is by looking at the societal causes, the, uh, all the various economic causes and so on, they set out from to starting point saying, we will show how your biology determines your station in life and this is true not only at an individual level, this is true at a societal level. And what that tells us is that you can't simply trust the science. The science is determined by the question you start off by asking. And that's why I think you know, one of the things we've learned during the pandemic is don't trust the science. Trust the, uh, ask yourself what question is being asked, answered and what question was what, what, uh, uh, really should be being, uh, be, being asked. And I, I think that, that that's always a healthy way to, to proceed. Now, and some other questions I wanted to come back to. One of the questions is about the working class in the East End of London. Because I think it's true. If it were the case that all that ever happened was working class opposition to racism, if all it was was mobilizations against raids, opposition to capturing slave, slave, runaway slaves in, in East London, opposition to every government announcement over deportations, we would be living in a very happy place, wouldn't we? But not only that, there'd be no battles to be had. It would mean that actually racism as an ideology would have failed. The problem is that ra racism is a battleground. It's an ideological battleground. And things go backwards and they go forwards. And if we think about what, what this area was like in the 1970s, it was the centre of the most ferocious battle. It was a battle between the National Front, the fascists of the National Front, who I have to say are nothing like what r r passes for fascism in Britain today. This was a massive force that came third in the London elections, we had votes of over 100,000 people, we had street stalls and marches in every area of London, but in particularly the poorest areas of London, that dared to march through immigrant areas like Lewisham and Southall and, and so on, and where black people were regularly killed. Not just here, not just Al Tabali, but let's think about Southall, let's think about all the other places. In fact, if you read, uh, for my pains, I've looked through socialist workers' coverage of anti-racism from about 1975 to about 1982, and it's horrific. Every week, another racist attack, another racist murder. In where I live, a family burnt out of their house and all of them killed by, by Nazis. It was a battleground. 
But at the same time, as the, ramp, the front were on the rampage, something else was happening. And that was the birth of mass anti-racism in Britain. And it meant that, for the first time, there was a huge movement that involved black, white, and brown people together fighting the Nazis. And that achieved, I think we cannot explain the huge differences that have happened in Britain over the question of racism in the last 50 years without acknowledging that. Two things we have to acknowledge. We have to acknowledge mass anti-racism and we have to acknowledge black struggle itself. If you look, look at all the wave of Indian factory strikes led by Indian workers, the, the strikes uh, and the resistance of community resistance to the Nazis that happened in many different areas, particularly in the north of England, and you combine that with the mass anti-racist movement, that is the explanation for how we got to a, from a time where when I grew up, when we had you know, all those stupid racist shows on British TV every bloody night, you know, uh, Love Thy Neighbour and all the other stuff, which had casual racist jokes made in all of them. How did we get from that to regularly seeing anti-racist uh, documentaries now on TV, to seeing the Steve McQueen dramas that we saw la la uh, two summers ago. The, the, we made the difference. Now, I'm not trying to present it as though working class people don't absorb racist ideas. There's a battleground, and it's crucial that we intervene and act on the battleground because we can change the direction of history, and that, I think, is, is, is absolutely crucial. Now, on the question of caste and the empire, I think this is very interesting. Now, it's not just caste where the British attempted to p apply a divide and rule tactic in order to try and head off the movement for independence. Uh, they tried exactly the same thing with, with Muslims. The setting up of a separate Muslim electorate in 1919 in Bengal, for example, was an attempt to specifically categorize Muslims as a separate group within Indian society. The setting up of a separate Indian, in, Indian, in, uh, Indian in, uh, Muslim university in India was the same thing. But these were all responses to a mass movement for independence. You know, it, it's very interesting. What does the British do after 1919 and the Amritsar massacre? Is that the response is to double down on questions of class and on uh, caste and on questions of, 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 of creating a separate Muslim identity in India. And ultimately, that proved uh, one of the ways in which they could try and undermine the, the, movement ag the movement against empire. And I think, you know, this is not something that we just see back then in history. Let's look at the world now, where people who are rulers all over the world attempt to articulate caste differences, tribal differences, uh, ethnic differences, lang linguistic differences, and they articulate them in, in particular ways to force divide and rule. Where did they learn that? They learned that precisely from the experience of colonialism. They learned that from the masters of, of that game, the British. The British could tell everyone a trick or two about how to, 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 manipulate, to manipulate people. So I think that's very, very important. Now, is it the case that because the people who can run uh, most of what, what once constituted the British Empire now act in this way today that they are merely an expression of their masters. And here I think we have to be careful. Now, it, what, we can what we can definitely say is they do act in the same way as the British, in the sense that they say use the same tactics. But the question is, why do they act the same way? They act the same way because they're implementing the same system of capitalism. Now, if you look at what's happening everywhere, is that they are implementing a system that needs divide and rule because it w capitalism depends on minority rule. And wherever you have a society where a tiny minority of people want to own and control all the wealth of society, division is necessary. And therefore, every ruler has to resort to tactics of this nature. It doesn't matter if they came through anti-colonialism. Once they're in power, they're forced to adopt the same methods. And we've seen that time and time again. Now, to say simply all they are is receiving orders. No, they're acting on their own interests. They want to stay in power. They want to stay rich. This is the policy you have to pursue. Then that's why they, 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 work, they work in that fashion. Now, what I think is great, and I'll just finish on this, is that I think the one, of the one of the ways in which decolonization opens up a debate, it's, it says, why should we be forced to experience the world in similar ways uh, 
to the way that our grandparents and great-grandparents did? Why should the world be so similar uh, to, to the way it was for, for them when we've done the business of kicking out our colonial rulers? But it means what it opens up the question is why we have to go to the next step. The next first step was removing the, pre the, the European imperial powers. The next step is removing their system, removing the whole system of capitalism from every part of the world. And that requires a, a, a movement on an international scale and one I think that we've seen more signs of uh, uh, now than we've seen uh, for, for, for many years in the past. And that should give us very many reasons to be optimistic.